history of, uh, of us. Um, so uh, our goal, though, is to have more uh, outreach uh, programs. So we need more people who are ready to do some things for outreach. So if you would, sign up, and we need your help. Uh, bring a friend. Um, so let's let's have your ideas and everything too to uh, finish that up. So okay, so okay, we we'll move on now to our speaker, <laughs> and um, uh, we have Alicia Brooks, as probably many of you are uh, familiar with. Uh, she joined the same year that we formed our group. Uh, there's an outreach uh, director for for them, and. Uh, She's also a director of the Civil Rights Memorial Center in Montgomery, Alabama. And she's worked 12 years at the National Conference for Community and Justice in LA. She's dedicated uh, uh, and committed civil rights activists. So she's uh, very, very uh, active in the community. Uh, well, she wants to talk about the, uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center, what it does and the history of it. And uh, they fight hate, they teach tolerance, they seek justice. And I've been a member for about 30 years, and I, that's one of the reasons I wanted to let you people know a little bit more about what the group does, because I'm very impressed with, with what they do. So it's, it's, I think, a very active and uh, good organization. And uh, I'm sure many of you who are members are familiar enough with uh, what they do. Um, I guess. We'll let, we'll let you come up now because I, there's time <laughs> wasted here, okay? So, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Okay, talk amongst yourselves while I switch up the computer, okay? Um, seriously, if you're next, I saw a lot of hands raised um, people who were here for the first time. So, if you're seated next to someone who's been here for the first time, should introduce yourself. Say who you are. Go ahead. All right. All right. Thank you. Well, thanks for you know. Okay, good morning, everyone. Is it still morning? Good morning. <laughs> uh, my name is Lisa Brooks, and I'm with the Southern Poverty Law Center. I want to thank Jerry for inviting me. Um, and he did invite me because he's a member of the Southern Poverty Law Center, and I'm just so happy to see other members uh, in the audience as well. Let me tell you a little bit about why I accepted Jerry's invitation to speak at Free Thought Arizona. First, it's not my first Free Thought gig, so I thought you should know that. Even though I'm in Montgomery, Alabama, my first talk with the Free Thought um, Association was in Alabama. Um, Auburn, you know, Auburn University is there, and around the university towns, you, you're likely to find some free thought associations. There was uh, an issue with a high schooler that was attending um, school in Auburn, and um, he wanted to start a, a secular student organization. And it being in Alabama, they said they couldn't do it. They <laughs> it <was> Alabama. And, <laughs> and, you know, we had to help out with that. And then uh, we wrote an article about the student in our Teaching College magazine. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about Teaching College later. But that brought a flurry of invitations to speak at a group in uh, Auburn and then in a little town called Opelika. And this group was like was hidden out in the backwoods. And uh, it was really very interesting. And that led to, to another big, um, I spoke to Free Thought Memphis and Free Thought um, Little Rock. Uh, little, little reason in the Rock, did anyone attend that conference? No? You guys don't want to miss it? Gotta get out. <laughs> um, and an association in, in Florida. Now the reason why I do it, and it really does tie into the work of the Southern Poverty Law Center, because our mission is to represent um, and advocate on behalf of society's most vulnerable members. Now, you all live, in, you're, even though you're in the West, you're in an A state, A like Alabama, Arizona. <laughs> and and <laughs> there's some vulnerable members here. So, um, in the South, and in particular across the Southeast, atheists, uh, free thinkers, agnostics, just in general, um, non-Christians, 
and in a particular form of Christians are, are really discriminated against. Um, and I have to say, you know, I, I work with, with a lot of different groups and, and really advocate on behalf of, uh, you know, kind of all oppressed and marginalized people. But, but people, non-believers in the South, are more reviled than any other group, I'm just saying. Um, it really is quite amazing. So I've learned a lot. And so I come to you because I want you to know that we're fighting for your rights, and I take, uh, I'm taking advantage of this opportunity that Jerry has presented to me to tell you a little bit about what we do in the whole state. You will also extend yourselves and begin to advocate on behalf of other people. Um, uh, my, my dealings with free thought people, they're always very well, very open to the information that I present, but it's often new, new, the news to them, which surprises me. So, so I want to challenge you to um, maybe hear things differently today, see things differently. One of the things that I respect about, about people who call themselves atheists or non-believers is that I really do count you as thinkers. So I want you to also not think purely in scientific terms, but think about the injustices that, that take place across across this country, in this state, just across across the globe every day, and to begin to advocate on their behalf too. If I could go back to the woman who celebrated who celebrated Halloween and was talking celebrate diversity where Halloween like thank you. If we could just think about that one button that you distribute, celebrate diversity. And we can't celebrate diversity until we first recognize diversity. So in all of its many forms. Okay, that's the end of my, my little lecture before I began. Okay, ready? The Southern Harvey Law Center was founded in 1971 by two men, two white men, that uh, I just make it a point of pointing out because it was in, in Montgomery, Alabama, in the deep, deep, deep south, where there's two white men, Joe Levin, raised in Reformed Judaism, and Morris Deeds, raised in the Southern Baptist tradition, found an organization that, as I say, is dedicated to advocating on behalf of society's most vulnerable members. This is the Civil Rights Memorial, and it sits in front of our offices in, in Montgomery. We commissioned this, this piece, and it was designed by Maya Lin, who's the artist and architect who designed the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. We wanted her to create this memorial um, that honored individuals who sacrificed so much during the Civil Rights Movement. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, sculpture, memorial, just like, just like, you know, very similar, rather, to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, it's black granite, and in the front where you see this table with water flowing over it, it tells the story of the movement between 1954, Brown v. Board, and 1968, the assassination of Dr. King. Behind it, behind that wall, there's a quote, and it's a biblical quote, if you, if you know, if you're familiar with that. It's from the book of Amos, and it says, until justice rolls down like waters, and righteousness like a mighty stream. Now, even though we're a secular organization, this other poverty law center is, um, we can find you know, great wisdom in the teachings of many different people. And we, we get a lot from this particular saying. It reminds us of what we have to do or what, what is left to be done, rather. We can all agree that there have been some uh, major progress since the Civil Rights Movement, but there's much, much, much to be done. Now, for uh, Morris and Joe, who, as I mentioned, were raised, um, you know, Morris is 76 years old and, and Joe is 71. So that lets you know that they were born in, in, in the South during the Jim Crow era. Two white men who were, who were born and raised and surrounded by this, this notion of white supremacy. And uh, they began to see their whole world change around them in Montgomery, beginning with the act of this woman, Rosa Parks, who, as you recall, used to go to first see on the bus. And she did it, she took a moral stand that day. She said that she was no, she was, she was, she was seated, first of all, just to clarify or to correct misinformation. She was seated in the black section. She didn't get on the bus to start any protest that particular day. She was going home from work, she was tired, um, and she sat in the black section. 
Now, um, the rules at the time for Montgomery City buses were that if the buses began to fill up, and when I say fill up, and then more white people came, then blacks had to give up their seat and the black section moved back. So Mrs. Park said she was not going to get up. She sat in that seat, she was in the black section and felt like she should be able to keep her seat. Well, as you know, she was arrested and um, the Montgomery bus boycott began. 382 days, people refused to get, uh, to ride the city buses until the US Supreme Court ruled in their favor. Now, we mark uh, Montgomery as kind of the birthplace of the civil rights movement, beginning with that, that act by Mrs. Parks in uh, 1955. This, a, few de a decade later, this is an image of uh, state troopers attacking peaceful protesters as they um, marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma in 1965, 10 years later. So Montgomery starts with the, with the Montgomery bus boycott and ends with the Selma Montgomery March, which is known as the Voting Rights March. All these things happen in between, and as I mentioned earlier, Joe and Morris see this change around them and know that, gosh, the South is going to be different. We, in fact, or going to be different. They had gone to law school, but decided that they wanted to they wanted to be a part of the civil rights movement to continue the legacy of Rosa Parks and all those many people who, who made these major sacrifices. This image that you're seeing now is the last leg of the Selma and Montgomery March. So they make their way to the Capitol, um, that, that's the Capitol in Montgomery down Dexter Avenue. And I like to show this image because it, it ends, it really marks the end of the, the uh, civil rights movement that was very unlike the beginning. In the beginning, it was, it was primarily black, disenfranchised black folks. For instance, um, for example, rather, the Selma and Montgomery March, when the state troopers beat back the protesters, there were about 600 people, overwhelmingly African American. Ended up, being 25,000 people, and that's the image that you see before you, 25,000 people, multiracial, multicultural, intergenerational, and multi-faith. All these people coming together to demand change. And really, that is how change happens successfully in the United States, when we all come together, and oftentimes on behalf of other people, not for ourselves, but on behalf of other people to create change, and that's what happened in Montgomery. Now, so that was 1965, 68, was the assassination of Dr. King. And most say that the modern American civil rights movement ended. Well, the Southern Poverty Law Center founded in 1971, as I mentioned, to, to ensure that the legacy of uh, the movement continued and that the sacrifices that were made were not in vain. Mm -hmm. So the early cases of the Southern Poverty Law Center were really uh, against the state of Alabama because Morris and Joe knew that Alabama was not going to just simply live up to, to the law because the civil, rights, the civil Rights Act because it was the law of the land or the, because the Supreme Court said it's the law of the land. Um, and as you know, the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 bans discrimination based on race in employment and in housing and in education and uh, access to public facilities. And then the Voting Rights Act, of course, opens up and guarantees the right to vote uh, for people who were formerly disenfranchised. Well, the early cases for SPLC as I mentioned are against the state. And the, in this instance, it's against um, the state because they refused to integrate the state trooper force, even though the Civil Rights Act said that they should. So Alabama said, no, we're just not gonna, we're not gonna integrate. A lower, and they said that. <laughs> and the lower court said, you really have to. And every time you hire a new state trooper, you must hire set amount of black people. I said, okay, well we just won't hire any state troopers. And that's what Alabama did. 15 years, this case went on, and it went all the way to the US Supreme Court uh, before, the, before Alabama was forced to integrate the state trooper force. I like this particular image because it shows not only was the state trooper force racially integrated, but women began to be and little known, well, it's a, it's a known fact that people, I think, don't pay attention to. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 opened up employment for women in ways that it had never before. In fact, lots of people say that the, the, the primary beneficiary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 were women. 
And so when you hear that kind of, you know, the Civil Rights Act was really kind of uh, for, for black folks, it really was for everyone. And women were the, the uh, primary beneficiary of that. We also sued um, cities, municipalities for refusing to open up uh, recreational facilities to blacks. You may have heard stories about how um, instead of instead of opening up a swimming pool, cities would just cement it over, close it down. And they did that in Montgomery. So you know we had to sue the YMCA, different places like that. But it wasn't until we represented this woman, Mrs. Buell McDonald, in Mobile, Alabama, that we came to national prominence. So in 1981, Mrs. Donald's son was abducted by two men who belonged to a group called the United Plans of America. Now, the United Plans of America were an awful group that um, did a lot of awful things during the Civil Rights Movement, including setting a bomb at 16th Street Baptist Church that killed four girls. You may be familiar with that story. They also were responsible for uh, firebombing uh, buses during, for the, the, the Freedom Riders Road. You may be familiar with the you know, Freedom Riders for college students, black and white, who began in Washington, D.C. and took buses through the southern states to uh, ensure that uh, buses were integrated. And of course, they were not when they made it to the South, in particular Alabama. The United Plans of America bombed them and beat the, beat the uh, Freedom Riders. They also killed a woman named Viola Liuzzo, who's a white woman from Detroit, who came to help with the voting rights march. Well, in 1981, when they killed her son, he wasn't a social activist, he was just a, he was on his way home from work, and they abducted him um, because the leader of the Klan organization was upset that um, another black man was found not guilty in the murder of a white police officer. So the Klan leader thought, well, we're gonna, we need to send a message to black folks that if they're going to sit on juries, they're going, they're going to find blacks guilty in the way, and guilty in the murder of whites. Well, they took their son, took her son, beat him, cut his throat, then brought him back to the neighborhood and lynched him from a tree. And his tree was right across the street from the, from the, uh, house, the house that the Klan leader lived in, because he wanted to see this this drama played out in front of him. And he hung there for quite a few hours. Well, Morris, very upset about this um, lynching, as you know, as anyone with conscience would be. And he thought, we really need to do something to hold the Klan responsible. Now, the two men who killed Michael Donald were eventually um, held liable or found guilty in criminal court. But the leader who set all this into motion, nothing was happening with him, and nothing had happened to the, the Klan uh, as an organization. So Morris thought, well, maybe we could sue the Klan in civil court, and that's what he did. So kind of loosely based this then new legal strategy on um, organized crime law, where you hold the leader responsible for the actions of their members. So the, one of the two guys who um, was found guilty in criminal court um, was, a, was, was spoke against the Klan leader in, in the civil case and verified that the Klan leader was the one that set this whole thing into motion. And so in 1987, an all-white jury in Mobile <coughs> finds in favor of Mrs. Donald. And this miracle happens. Um, the Klan is found responsible for the murder of Michael Donald and uh, must pay $7 million. Now, she didn't get $7 million because the Klan didn't have $7 million but it bankrupted that organization, and that really is our goal. The Southern Poverty Law Center is a nonprofit organization. We don't charge uh, our clients to represent them, nor do we share any of their award money. What we, what we revel in is putting these groups out of business. Well, there are certainly more than one plan organization, and so uh, Morris decided to try the strategy again a few years later, 1996 in South Carolina in this instance. This, this, in this instance, a Klan group was torching black churches. And so this was a 100-year-old black church in South Carolina, and as you can imagine, the members were quite upset. This, this produced the largest judgment in civil court against any extremist group, $37.8 million. Took it on the road again, and took it up north because hate groups are not just in the South. 
In this instance, this was in uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and a group uh, called Nation, Aryan Nation, led by a man named Tom Metzger, who comes out of uh, uh, San Diego, California, had this huge compound in, in Idaho. It had lots of property and lots of land. It had all these buildings, kind of like this one, had a school, and they had a so-called church, and they would invite groups up, and they'd have concerts, and conventions, and you know, train up, um, new recruits in the ways of uh, uh, white supremacy. Well, one day, uh, a black woman and her son were driving by the compound. And a couple years ago, I, got, I had a chance to visit where this compound used to be, and I could see the road. She was just driving by. She was in an older car, and her car backfired. And on this compound, they had you know, security sentries posted because the Air Nation thought that the Jews were going to come and get them. So when this car backfired, um, these, these guys who were on, on post and security said, the Jews are here, the Jews, the Jews are here. They had been drinking also. So they got their guns, got in the car, and then chased after this car. And then they found that it was a black woman and, and her son. Like, Jews, black people, same thing. So they went after them and chased them for two miles in a car, ran them off the side of the road, pistol pistol with, with them. Thank goodness they didn't kill them. Um, a neighbor came out with his weapon and uh, threatened them. So, in any case, we, we sued the Aryan Nation, and this produced a $6 million judgment. Now, in this instance, they had this, all this property, so they had to turn over their property to our client in settlement of the judgment. So this is a picture of, once she got the property, she raised all of the buildings. And, and she, turned, she turned it over to the city, and now it's a peace park. Very um, our, our most recent case against a Klan group was in Kentucky. And this guy in the center, his name is Ron Edwards. And he was the leader of uh, about a dozen groups that were connected to the Imperial Clans of America. His group in Kentucky, as is the case for a lot of um, Klan groups across the United States, their membership numbers are dwindling. So he sent out some guys to the county fair to recruit new members. Our client, Jordan Groover, he was 16 years old, was also at the fair that night. Sorry, I don't have a picture of Jordan, but he's about 16 years old, about my height, um, biracial, his mother's white, his dad is a uh, Puna Indian. But they tagged him as an illegal immigrant, or what they call him spit. They call him an illegal spit, and really beat this boy within an inch of his life. Um, and Ron Edwards, we said in civil court, set all that into motion. So we were able to sue. Ron Edwards in the Imperial Plans of America and really greatly reduced, remember I said it had about a dozen, had about a dozen chapters across the Southeast. After this judgment, he had two. Um, and then he was so, so, <laughs> he was so taken upon, he had to, he had to um, go into, into criminal activity, into meth sales, and now he's in prison for, for meth sales. In any case, that was our most recent civil suit. Now, we can't sue every um, hate group in the United States. So our other strategy to combat hate groups is to publicize who they are, where they are, and what they're about. So each year, we create this what we call hate map. And it identifies all the active hate groups in the United States. This is the map for 2013. There are 939 active hate groups in the United States. Now, um, you can go to our website and invite you to do so. It'll show you kind of what those different symbols mean. And some of them are clans, some of them are neo Nazi, black separatists, Christian identity, and, and the like. Um, if you take in this map, you can see, you know, there's a high concentration in the southeast, which no one's ever surprised to see. But no, the high concentration in the northeast. Always been a high concentration of hate groups in the Northeast. Um, and the most populous states, California, Texas, and Florida, have the most hate groups. Now, this marks uh, about a 50% increase in the number of active hate groups since the year 2000 when we first started doing this accounting. The good news, I guess, is that um, it's down slightly from 2012, high of 10, um, 1007. In 2011, well, 1018. So we're seeing a little bit of a dip. You all in Arizona have 20. 
And it's interesting. It's like right in the center. Um, what I was trying to look at, so you, could go, you could go to our website and look this up as I mentioned. It'll also give you the list so, so that you can easily see where these groups are um, and what their ideology is. I noted that you have some neo Nazi groups, really the most um, um, dangerous and the, and the largest neo Nazi group in the United States. Uh, the Nationalist Socialist Movement has chapters here in, in Tucson. And you have a Klan group, you have some white nationalist groups, you have a white nationalist group, group in Tucson called Free America. So you want to check those out, it's always good to know where, where folks are in relation to yourself. You have some anti-LGBT groups, so we, we identify hate groups um, not based on any criminal activity, but really they're defined by um, their ideology. And if they are, if they have a belief for, uh, a belief that vilifies a whole group of people based on their immutable characteristics, then they're a hate group. They don't have to have committed any, any criminal act as I said. And this, is, this includes kind of white supremacists, and um, a few years ago we started, we started adding anti-LGBT groups. And the reason why we added anti-LGBT groups to the hate list is because these, their rhetoric, their lies, and their misinformation leads to an increase in hate crimes that are targeted um, towards people who are LGBT or those that are perceived to be. You also, you, this film does surprise to you, you have a number of anti immigrant groups. As I mentioned, the good news is that um, it sounds slightly overall across the nation. This map shows you, gives you kind of a bird's eye view of where the groups are. The darkest red are the states that have 50 or more hate groups, and then take it down a shade, 30 to, 30 to 50, 10 to 30, and so on. Um, so if you, if you were ever to consider moving anywhere, you could kind of see where the, where the, <laughs> where the next places would be. Um, and, and I did mention that the overall number of hate groups are down, the number of anti-LGBT groups are up. And we're not really surprised by that because whenever kind of a group begins to assert its rights, then there's a, a, a counter attack against that group. But the primary reason for the increase in the number of um, hate groups in the United States since 2000 is because of our changing or shifting demographics. In 1970, the United States looked more like this, about 83% white, 17% 70, people of color. And for lots of folks, that's, that's their ideal, that's America. There's diversity, <laughs> not too much. Um, today though, it looks more like this, 66% white, 34% people of color. And you won't be surprised, you're in Arizona, and I'm in California, and you know, some of the border states began these, these demographic shifts long ago. But it's just really beginning in the Southeast and in the Midwest, and Put it mildly, it's bringing some people out. 66% white, 34% people of color. And when, you, when, when there wasn't that kind of diversity before, and if you can really think back to when the demographics began to shift here, because I can, when you know, I was in California, it can be unsettling. It really, it really can be. So this is new for um, a lot of folks. It's not new, though, is the data. And demographers have been talking about this, predicting this shift for some time. And, um, you know, this, this is what, this is what the, the data shows, is that, you know, that population growth grow 85% amongst people of color and only 15% amongst whites. Um, I have another chart that, that I don't have with me, but really breaks it out by, by, racial, by racial and ethnic group. Um, the, 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 the largest growing group really is Asian and Pacific Island, they're not Latino, Hispanic, they're most people think. Asian and Pacific Island, both about 35% when you com combine Asian and Pacific Islander. And Latino, the Latino Hispanic really is, you know, 32, 35% as well. There's an increase of about 18% in the American Indian population, which I think is super, like, you know, <laughs> great, it's great. Um, what I'd also like to point out, though, is that the, the African American and black population growth really echoes or mirrors the, the white growth. It's, it's stunted. And even though 
you know, if you listen to Fox News or you know other <laughs> other other news sources, you would think that oh, yes, blacks are everywhere and, and are responsible for everything. But our population um, is about you know kind of eight to ten percent, and will continue to, to decline as the white population um, declines. Pretty much the same. If we have an increase in um, um, biracial, multi people identify as biracial or multiracial, those tend to pull down numbers um, black. Um, some people call it that we're at this critical tipping point. Um, uh, conventional wisdom says that by 2043, whites will no longer be in a numerical majority. And you can see how that began to shift over time, right? Um, in the past, and like currently, we think of, we think of the shifting demographics in terms of black and white and maybe Hispanic. But as we move forward, you'll begin to see this, this these other, increase in the Asian and Pacific Islander group that I mentioned and the American Indian group. Like um, the Hispanic is the maroon and Asian and Pacific Islander is the green and the kind of uh, uh, orangish is American Indian and the purple is, is multiracial. So you can, and white is the blue. So you see that pie shrinking amongst the white population. What I'd like to point out, the obvious that people, you know, in the midst of their fears don't always recognize is that there's no clear majority. There'll be no clear majority for a while. So we have, I think, a really unique and special opportunity to um, begin to put into practice the ideals for which we say, you know, we, we hold so dear. We can um, learn how to live together. Um, four states currently already have, four states already have um, what they call a majority minority majority minority population, where whites are not in the numeric um, majority, that would be California, New Mexico, Texas, and Hawaii. And the states listed on the, on the right there are pretty close to it. And we'll flip, it'll, it'll, it'll flip, I think, quicker or sooner than um, predictions would, would have to believe. So shifting demographics are the number one reason for the growth in papers in the United States. The second reason is the economy. And um, I chose this particular headline because, again, if you, don't, if you watch Fox News, you would think we're still in a, in a, in a recession. And I, I, I should just blame them. Lots of people think we're still in a recession. But the truth is, intellectually, we also know that we're not. Um, perception, though, is, is reality. And people perceive, you, perceive themselves to be in a recession or us to be in a recession, so we are. So this economic downturn that, that was really at a critical point in 2008, people still perceive themselves to be in that, even though that's not the reality. Um, and when that happens, you know, groups like the National Socialist Movement, and this is Jeff, Jeff Shute, calls himself the Commandant, says when the economy suffers, people are looking for answers. And we are the answers for white people. And, and you know, people buy it. When you're in an economic, economic downturn, or you lost your job or, or something's not going right with you, you're looking for a scapegoat or someone to blame. Um, it's the image, it's the blacks, it's the this, it's the that. It's never my own responsibility for you know, my own life. That, that's kind of what happens there. So what we're trying to do at the Southern Poverty Law Center is um, shine a light on these groups and marginalize them in such a way that um, people begin to think twice before aligning themselves with these groups. Oftentimes, the groups that are not, um, don't call themselves Klan groups or, or even neo-Nazi groups, um, have these innocuous kind of, you know, patriotic sounding names and people join them. This happened, this happened um, um, really in the, in the height of the whole anti-immigrant frenzy that was happening in Arizona and Alabama. They create these groups that have these patriotic sounding names and people join and they say, you know, they're affiliated with a hate group. So we published this magazine called The Intelligence Report, which you have investigative journalists who just scour the country and you know see who, who's going to who's who's attending whose group meeting, right? Who's running for public office? And um, we might say, oh, he's running for public office, and but he also went to this 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 hate group's meeting, or he's affiliated with a hate group. So we just kind of you know sound an alarm and, and try to point out things to, to folks. A 
But first and foremost, the magazine is published to assist law enforcement and Homeland Security in identifying what we call the threat from domestic terrorists. And domestic terror terrorists are these hate groups. And Klan groups used to be known as domestic terrorists. We used to refer to, to these groups as domestic terrorists before we became all obsessed with foreign terrorists. So um, we just want to remind folks that there's a real and present threat here. And that is sent to them. We also publish, um, or, or produce rather, um, some videos we call roll call videos that we make available to law enforcement agencies so that they have information that helps them to easily identify more easily identify who belongs to these groups. As you see here, um, we did one on skinhead, we did one on Aryan prison gangs, we also did one on, on sovereign citizens. And sovereign citizens are really dangerous, dangerous groups that are threatening um, very present a very real threat to law enforcement officials and are responsible for a number of murders of law enforcement officials. So we want, you know, we want them to be prepared um, to deal with these people and be able to protect themselves. Of course, the third, the third reason why we have an increase in, in hate groups is President Obama. Not his policies, not anything, just him, the picture. <laughs> is enough to um, cause this increase in the number of hate groups. And, and you can see, it just, it shot up exponentially when um, he became president. Another thing that happened um, when after Obama became president is that we saw this tremendous, and I mean tremendous, 500% increase in the number of radical anti-government groups in the United States. See, in 2008, we're at 149. Obama comes in and shoots up to 1,200. It's gone down a little bit because after the re-election in uh, 2012, and they're gonna, I guess there's nothing we can do. Um, but it didn't go down that much. There's still quite a number of uh, radical anti-government groups. And I think, you know, you agree, in, in any democracy there's always going to be, there should be some, you know, kind of groups that, that do a check and balance on government, but the, but the tone and tenor of the anti-government groups today is far beyond what we've ever seen before. This, this rise in groups like the sovereign citizens, who refuse to accept any federal, the, refuse to accept the federal government's authority over them. You see things like happened at um, Bundy Ranch in uh, Las Vegas, where um, uh, government officials, the Bureau of Land Management, go to to impose a fine and, and take this cattle, and you have these anti-government zealots who are armed to the teeth, ready to shoot um, government officials. Then right after that standoff, when the government uh, backed down, you have these two people, these two individuals, who are at the Bundy Ranch, go to Vegas and shoot these, these law enforcement, just shoot them um, for no reason whatsoever, and then put a, a flag over them that denotes their affiliation, uh, uh, of their belief as, a, as, a, as an anti-government group, this don't tread on the uh, flag that they draped over the officers to kill, after they killed them. So, this, this threat of, of this threat from, from radical anti-government groups is, is very, very real. Um, in Georgia, in the Georgia, a couple, couple of months ago, there was another guy, a sovereign citizen, who um, went into the, the courthouse and just started shooting people. These people, in light of, um, of increasingly loose um, gun, gun control laws, are, are just becoming more and more brazen. Um, they have an open carry law now in Arizona and Georgia, we have open carry in Alabama, and these people are taking it quite seriously. This is our map for radical anti-government groups. You can also access this on the website. You have 34. And I really, um, I really encourage you to take a look at who they are, where they are, and what they're about, because they're really very threatening. On a positive note, um, well, to create some positive Across the nation, we created the Teaching Tolerance Program, really to thwart um, the, the the impact of, of these hate groups. What, what we began to notice is, is that a lot of people who belong to hate groups, other than these old clan guys who are dying off, um, in these in these neo-Nazi groups, in particular the National Socialist Movement, they're young. So we thought, um, let's create a program that celebrates diversity and teaches kids
kids to um, uh, embrace it before they become susceptible to messages of hate. So that's why we created Teaching Tolerance. It really is about just throwing all these resources, quality resources at educators who publish this magazine twice a year, send it out to every school across the country. Um, and it has anti-bias material, anti-bias lessons um, across any number of, of different groups, race, race anti-Semitism, anti-immigration, size, you know, uh, all of it, uh, class. And we've had a number of articles and lessons that address uh, faith or, and the rights of atheist students or, and ethnostics and such. Now, even though, and this happens, you know, it happens all the time, even though, um, in, even though something has been, been proven to be constitutional, that doesn't stop school, school districts or or governmental, official, governmental officials from um, infringing on people's rights. Um, and that's the case with this moment of silence phenomena that, that, that comes in and out of vogue in, in schools. The uh, court, courts ruled long ago that um, schools can have, can promote a moment of silence as long as they're not also promoting uh, prayer or any particular belief or, or belief over someone's contemplative silence. So you can have a moment of silence, but it has to truly, genuinely be um, a moment of silence. Got the guidelines from the U.S. Department of Education. Read, Teacher, teachers and school administrators should ensure that no student is in any way coerced to participate in any religious activity. So the moment of silence must be neutral, and it must not encourage prayer at all. It's perfectly, it's perfectly fine if um, a teacher, as a rule, and I'm, I'm a former teacher myself, if I would just start my classroom out with a moment of silence every day, if that was just part of my ritual, as long as it did not um, promote anything. It just might be a kind of a way to quiet up the mind and get ready for the day. That's perfectly, perfectly okay. It can also be used and is used um, unconstitutionally when your uh, teacher is commemorating a death or um, some major tragedy. It's okay. Uh, in fact, it could be helpful to the students to have um, a moment of silence. Another thing that um, that is um, rearing its head again is this whole thing about the Pledge of Allegiance and whether or not students can be compelled to participate in the Pledge of Allegiance. Now, this is this has been decided by the court, you know, some time ago, although it, it hasn't quite been decided definitively whether or not schools can demand that teachers lead the pledge. It has been decided that students do not have to participate in the Pledge of Allegiance, and teachers and school administrators cannot pressure them to do so. Um, and they cannot be forced to, to recite the pledge, and more importantly, they can't be retaliated against because they don't want to participate in it. Um, recently, I think it was in South Carolina, um, a teacher was just, just, just so upset because the student said, I don't, I'm not going to participate in the pledge, I don't have to, I'm just going to sit here. The teacher just was so incensed um, and said, you know, well, here, I'm going to suspend you, you're going to be in trouble. And said, this, the student clearly knew his rights uh, far better than the teacher did, and, and of course the student won. So we have lessons really to help educators because they don't always know this. Uh, sometimes educators say, well, okay, we just won't say anything about religion, and, and that's not true. You can teach about religion as long as you're teaching kind of about religion and not promoting any one religion. You should also teach about um, the, the, the rights of non-religious people, and we have quite a number of lessons on that. Um, and we find that teachers, primarily middle school and high school, take advantage of these lessons. Um, teaching tolerance has a, um, a very, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, popular blog space where uh, we invite people to kind of submit blogs on any number of topics, and um, quite often people who write on topics of atheism and, and, and the rights of non-believers always write about it. Um, I wanted to talk about this was just this was a this was to remind you to talk about um, what we've been noticing. Um, it's not necessarily legal, but I just thought it was interesting. Um, Jerry and I were talking about it in the car last night, and I'm sure.
sure you all were talking about the whole Bill Maher thing and you know Islam and all that. You, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, and I guess to tell you this because, and, and I, I like Bill Maher to say that. Um, and I'll also say that he's 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 one of those non-thinking fundamentalist atheists. I'll just say that. Um, there, 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 there's a real danger, and I don't know why. I, I have no, I'm no right other than I have an opportunity on my to tell you, to tell you how I feel. Um, but I really just want to caution you uh, on, on, on not becoming the fundamentalist that you rail against, right? Um, that that um, I was reading this guy. Maybe you've heard of him, Reza Osman? Reza Osman? Oh. Do you know him? R E Z A A S L A N. Incredible. I really like him. So he's talking about the this the, the new atheists, these fundamentalists that, 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 that he's talking about. And I thought he presented a really, really important um, argument. He says that people don't derive their values from religion. They bring their values, cultural, nationalistic, ethnic, and political prejudices to religion. I believe that, and, and I believe the same happens in terms of people who are not religious, religious, right? So you're not religious, but you also bring your values, cultural, nationalistic, ethnic, and political prejudices to whatever system that you, you uh, fashion for yourself, right? He says that people insert their values into their scriptures or their teaching, and I really believe that. So we have to, I know I wanted to mention this, in terms of in terms of teaching tolerance and expanding um, our understanding and truly celebrating diversity. And not, not that you all would do this, but to not fall into this easy trap of uh, uh, Islamophobia and being uh, anti-Islamic uh, based on kind of you know, nationalistic hysteria. Um, or to believe, that, to believe that ISIS or ISIL is primarily motivated by um, religious beliefs, and then it, because they are not right, and people who, pla who practice, and you know this, people who practice their religion are motivated by a lot lots of other diff other different things, um, and I just feel like it's really, really just so dangerous to um, allow ourselves to to follow that slippery slope and condemn people based on any in any part of who they are. So. So the religion, and it could be it could be non-religion, the good, the bad, the ugly. Because there's a good, bad, and the ugly in all of it. And I think it's important that we keep we 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 remember that. Um, back to what I was saying earlier about um, my belief that atheists or people who, who profess atheism and even agnosticism are often um, discriminated against in, in ways that other groups are not. I really do believe this. I was reading about um, this, did, did you hear about Ron Reagan's ad that he wanted to, to have on uh, CBS, he wanted to show on 60 Minutes. It was just benign, just this little 30 second spot that um, was advocating for separation of church and state. It was really very, very benign, very, very nice. And they said no, <laughs> that they wouldn't, they wouldn't air his ad, right? And so, um, uh, so there's, there's there's some kind of suit pending, but when I think about I think about things like that, and as this article pointed out, I said, okay, you know, we can talk about um, what is that erectile dysfunction and every other possible <laughs> thing we want to talk about, but we can't have an ad about the separation of churches. It just it just it just is really really amazing. Um, on the other on the other end, and you have what's happening in New York, and I don't know if you're familiar with this. And this is the second time this has happened where a group that we identify as a hate group, led by a woman named Pam Geller, who are spending millions of dollars taking out um, uh, anti-Islam ads and putting them in the New York subways. And these are hateful, hateful, hateful ads um, about, Mus about Muslims. So that's okay. You know, it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a crazy schizophrenic um, world that we live in. And this is about the kid that, that um, Knew, knew that he didn't have to say the Pledge of Allegiance. So coming back to the work of the Southern Poverty Law Center, we are primarily a civil rights um, litigation group, 
and we will um, bring lawsuit against any, now we don't typically fight for individuals, but class of people. So any particular class of people that's being discriminated against, um, um, their civil rights are not being protected, we would represent them. What we do now, in addition to um, our lawsuits against hate groups, is that we, we have a couple of different practice areas. Uh, Im uh, immigration, uh, we have an immigrant justice project, we have an LGBT rights project, we have a children's rights project, which um, this image is, is meant to remind you of that, where we are really working across the South on behalf of children who are tried as adults, children who are thrown into um, adult facilities and subjected to to the most you know horrific uh, abuse from guards and, and other adult inmates, um, and even subject to abuse when they're lucky enough to be um, put in a juvenile detention facility that are increasingly owned and operated by private companies that care nothing about um, children. So we're doing a, a, a lot of law in that area. I wanted to show you this video, and I promise I'll be over. It's a, it's a very short clip about our economic justice work. Um, and again, because I think it's happening in, it's happening in Alabama now, it'll probably soon be happening in Arizona. <laughs>
open up JTS, period. That's something that never should happen. So what we're finding is that, that there's a return of this thing called debtor's prison. And it is, proven years ago, that, that it's unconstitutional for anyone to have to go to jail because they can't pay their fines, because they can't pay their bills. But it's happening because of this thing of, of cities and um, uh, cities contracting with these private companies like JCS to get their, to, to get, get their fines. So a company will say, um, it seems to me that, that, that you know, we could be more effective at making sure that people pay their traffic tickets and you do. You, you let us collect, you let us be essentially be, be your bill collector and we promise you that we will, um, you know, get you back $2 million in unpaid parking tickets. And so cities, especially small cities or, you know, medium-sized cities who are having some uh, financial um, uh, difficulties managing things, see this as a, um, more expedient, less less uh, expensive way to handle their business to contract out something to a private company. So they're doing it without really knowing what they're getting into, and that's what happened with the city of Montgomery. They were just trying to find a way to be to 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 collect these unpaid tickets, and they had no idea that JCS was going to operate in that way because once JCS was in to get their money, right? They were going to get back a certain amount of money based on what, what, what the person paid. If they determined that the person could no longer pay, then they, had, they didn't want to have anything to do with them because they weren't going to get any more money. So off to jail you go. There's the threat of jail that keeps the person paying, but once they determine that they can't pay, they write off their loan and the person goes to jail. Um, another thing that I, that I hope you heard in, in this Cleveland story is that she took out a payday loan. We're also trying to do um, bring some greater light and accountability to this whole system. I think I saw, I think I saw something about Arizona on uh, on uh, John Oliver did that special on payday loans, and he was he was talking about some of your legislature. Same thing in Alabama. We can't get any decent fair uh, legislation around payday loans, and 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 this this out, out, outrageous interest that people are being charged because we're finding that legislatures or legislators are the ones that actually own these paid loan companies or they work for them. It's awful. So we've done a couple of reports that show we got a paid loan company in Alabama to admit that they exist to prey on poor people or people who can't afford it. And then this whole thing of the, the uh, uh, in, in some places in Montgomery, you can look out on the street corner and see five or six different payday loan pay places just looking down one street. And the fact that there are no banks or credit unions or reputable institutions to provide the services that people need is just, it's, it's, it's just unconscionable. So, you know, people get caught in, in, in these traps. And so the, that, those are some of the issues that we're trying to address through, um, through our economic justice. We're doing a lot of other work thanks to you know our supporters, and that really um, um, is just a broad stroke overview of what we do. And it brings me back to the slide that, that I began with, and the quote from um, Dr. King, paraphrasing uh, Amos, of course. And he said this. At the, Dr. King said this during the march on Washington, when um, kind of after the civil rights um, activists had. Become, become discouraged, really, because the March on Washington was in 1964. Remember I said that this whole thing began kind of in 1955 with Rosa Parks and the Montgomery bus boycott. So by 1964, before the passage of the Civil Rights Act, people were really getting discouraged, really getting, you know, 1963, sorry, 1963, people were getting discouraged. And you have the bombing, you have all this stuff still happening, and, and change is not happening. So it was in that atmosphere that, um, the um, union uh, of, of uh, porters, what are they called? You know, the um, sleeping car porters union started uh, uh, to prepare to this, organize this march on Washington, and Dr. King was a part of it. But it was a very, very, very radical march. If you go back and listen to the marches and the people who spoke at that um, at the march on Washington, what we hear now is. Of course, the sanitized version of um, Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech in just that particular frame. 
But people came to Washington to demand action. And Dr. King started his speech off in that way. He started out saying, no, we are not satisfied, and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters in righteousness like a ministry. So, thank you. most of us, 
Um, we have moved beyond teaching tolerance, but, but trust me, people have not. And so remember when I say that people get this magazine in every school across the United States. If we called it anything more radical than teaching tolerance, it would be blocked. It would not be allowed in. Now, I also say, and, and this is the truth, that the articles on the inside, even though teaching tolerance might sound like, you know, diversity 101, the articles on the inside are very progressive and very radical. We have articles about, you know, everything. And, and we would not be able to get those, you know, we're, we're trying to be kind of covert, you know, in, in getting this information to teachers. So that's, that's another reason. And, you know, I think if we read, if we, if we allow that title to not distract from what the real work is, we'll be okay. Hi. Um, I appreciate your uh, work also on the economic justice yes, issue. Yes, uh, I'm a victim advocate in my day job, so it reminds me of a kind of a related issue that I really deal with just about every day with, with crime victims, and that's the issue of criminal restitution. Every day I see in court uh, defendants sentenced to pay often very large amounts of restitution back to, to crime victims for, for actual losses that, that have been, uh, been caused. And it's, it's just a real unfortunate system in a, in a lot of ways for, for both victims and for defendants. Uh, there is a victim compensation program that can pay for medical bills, but let's say somebody uh, drives drunk and destroys an innocent victim's car, the victim may be impoverished themselves, and the victim compensation does not cover the property part, just covers the medical part. Um, a defendant could, you know, even if they get out of prison after a couple of years, they could be stuck with no credit, reduced job opportunities, and the victim still may never get paid back anyway because there's no good option. So I, I wonder if uh, there's any uh, discussion perhaps at, uh, at the center of, of some good public policy recommendations about how to fix uh, the, the, the criminal justice, restitution part of the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, no, we haven't had any discussions about that. I mean, that's a short answer, and I, I completely agree with you. Um, what we are trying to do is we're, we're, we are moving away from litigation when we recommend, especially when, when you know, we're suing school districts and, and groups and organizations in the Southeast that don't have any authority to state governments, right? Um, so we're moving more to different forms of advocacy and really trying to, to get them to see the, the, the logic in accepting our policy recommendation or creating some kind of change before we have to sue. Now, if you refuse, like Alabama does quite often, um, even with the anti-immigration thing, it, 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 it's a shame that the state would waste, it, would waste money um, uh, defending something that was blatantly unconstitutional. And, and I think we, we, we could safely say the same is true around all our litigation. It, and that happens quite often. So it really takes, you know, kind of a wise person on the other side who says, okay, you're right, we're gonna, we're gonna lose, right? Um, so one of the things we're trying to do is, 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 to, is to attack it from a different way and don't always lose. But you reminded me of a story I wanted to share that I forgot about this guy, they very, Hazel, did you hear about him? An atheist that was awarded $2 million in California um, just recently, I think last week, um, after his parole was revoked for refusing to acknowledge a higher power. He, <laughs> he, he had to go to jail, for, he went to jail for that, and um, he agreed to participate in a, in a recovery program, but he said, you know, he wanted it to be a non-religious program. Well, and when he was on parole, they made him go to a 12-step program, and he was in the 12-step program, and he, you know, refused to acknowledge a higher power. And during the meetings, he would kind of mock them or whatever. And so then they got mad, and then sent him and said he re 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 and revoked his parole and sent him back to prison for like a year. <laughs> so, so he sues, and, and uh, a three-judge panel uh, of the now ninth district ruled in his favor. And, and so there you go, two million dollars. So who? California doesn't have two million dollars, but. Let it be a deterrent. So now California's policies 
supposedly have changed where they had to offer a non-religious recovery program. I mean, it's easy, it's easy. I mean, you know, so. I'd like to point out that uh, SOS is part of our group. We have one that is a non-religious group. Mm -hmm. And so for those of you who have either any addictions or you know people who need help but don't believe in God, um, this, we have a program. Yeah, uh, a huge number of blacks are sitting in jail because of the war on drugs. To what extent are you trying to get these uh, drug laws repealed or, or at least fight for, uh, let's say, the sentencing that's occurring? I think there's a federal law that say there's minimal sentences for certain uh, possession or, uh, or sale of drugs. Mm -hmm. That's not a primary work, but we will work within the state. Um, Senator Sessions, uh, you know who he is? <laughs> Senator Sessions from um, Alabama. He's, he's not, you wouldn't consider him an ally, right? Um, <laughs> but he proposed some change in, um, in, in drug laws relative to possession of, of cocaine, crack cocaine, powder cocaine. So we'll work with the legislature on that kind of policy, and if there if there are opportunities to do that, we work with them. But it's not a prime it's not it's not a primary work. What 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 the policy change that we work towards primarily is around prison rights and detention rights and, and those kinds of things. Prisoner rights, not prison. If you have questions, please come up to the microphone. A few years ago, there was a lot of contention between social justice groups. The contention was that the Southern Poverty Law Center had too much money, ironically. Mm -hmm. And they were saying, well, they get all the attention and they're not using all their money. It's all stashed away. And that if they just gave us these other groups the same attention and money, they could do more good. Who's the they? I don't remember now this. I mean, who's the they that, that give us the money? I'll just say, yeah, we have a lot of money. Um, we, have a, we, have, we have a large endowment, and um, we're quite proud of that in our fiscal management of the, of the donor dollars. We don't get any government money. We, get very, we don't get any kind of huge grants from, like, you know, Gates or, you know, any of these big corporations because, or Walmart or anybody like that because, you know, we can sue anybody at any, any moment, so we don't take any of that money. Um, all our money is, comes directly from individual members. And I would say that we have um, probably a couple hundred thousand individual members who contribute on average maybe 75 to to $100 a year, and that's how we made our money, and that's how we have our money. And we continue to fundraise just like we did um, when we began the organization, because Morris is of the opinion that at one point, at, at one day, he'll be gone and he won't be able to raise money. We, um, uh, our, our donors primarily have given in the past because of Morris. Now, you know, we're, we're, we're planning for life after Morris, but if we can't, if we can't get any more money after Morris is gone, who knows? Then we'll have money to continue to work. And so that's our primary concern, is that we'll be able to continue to work into, into the foreseeable future. Now, before I joined the Southern Poverty Law Center, I worked for the National Conference for Community Justice, formerly the National Conference of Christians and Jews. Had a 60-year history, and we were in Los Angeles, and we were the flagship region for that organization. 60-year history went down, you know, just like any other nonprofit. So nonprofits are not guaranteed, because they do good work, not guaranteed to continue to exist. Nonprofits like the one that I used to work for and a lot of other nonprofits have, um, have to kind of um, live off of dinners or golf tournaments or that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, we don't. We're in an enviable position. We've been spending down on our endowment, I think, at least over the last 10 years. We, we take big chunks out of it every year. Um, we're able to go to where um, uh, the work is needed and to do what needs to be done because we have, you know, this large endowment because we're able to do it. So we're not, we're not stopped by it. And I think, you know, not at any moment. We've, we've only increased 
the work that we do, never decrease the, the, the work that we do. So, you know, I feel, I, I feel really good about it. <laughs> For those who usually go to lunch and we take the, the large room, 2,500 seat, we don't have that reserved this time, uh, as already spoken for. So we'll have to find rooms out there or stay out in the main area. So uh, thanks for coming. We thank you all. It.